moderating today's webinar. I'm Nicole Truag, Associate Director of the UW-Madison Center for Financial Security. Today our webinar is Encouraging the Use of Retirement Savings Contribution Credit through Vita Sites. Our webinar is part of the Family and Financial Security Series, sponsored by a grant from the UW-Madison School of Human Ecology Beckner Endowment. Today's presenter is Jonathan Spader, Associate at Apt Associates, and our discussants are Jackie Lynn Coleman, Senior Director, National Community Tax Coalition, and Richard Keeling, Senior Tax Analyst, National Partnerships, IRS, SPEC. Just a couple of quick housekeeping items for our participants today. If you have any technical difficulties, please call 1-800-442-4614. And to submit questions for the Q&A portion of the webinar, locate the dark gray bar near the top of media site, click on the Ask a Question icon, and a window will open. Please type your name, email address, and your question and hit send. And just one other reminder, our, um, the presentations and the webinar will be archived at cfs.wist.edu uh, within the next week. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to John Spader. Okay, great. Thank you, Nicole. Um, I just want to say thank you to the Center for Financial Security for inviting us to give this webinar um, and also for setting everything up so that we could do it here from D.C. Um, so today's topic is the Savers Credit, um, and more specifically, a pilot demonstration and evaluation that um, my t that our team at Apt Associates um, did in partnership with several other entities. So Chris Herbert at the Joint Center for Housing Studies at Harvard um, is a partner in this, as well the National Community Tax Coalition. So Jackie Coleman will be on the phone later to talk about their role, um, and Holden Weissman there worked with her as well. And, and then also two large um, VITA programs. So the the center. Or the Campaign for Working Families in Philadelphia, and, and Accountability Minnesota in, in Minneapolis, St. Paul. So it's, it, it's a large team, but as you'll see, this really is a, a very hands-on project where we were implementing a pilot demonstration at the same time that we were collecting um, information and, and, and performing evaluation activities to both learn about that intervention um, and also to, to produce information that, that's helpful um, for policy discussions around the Savers Credit itself. So I, I do want to sort of highlight that distinction up front because um, I think it will um, help you trace through um, my slides um, the distinction between the intervention and the evaluation activities. I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean by those two um, in a minute, um, but just know that both of those were happen happening simultaneously, so implementation of the pilot um, and some evaluation activities. So if I can go to slide two then, um, this is, I know those of you watching probably weren't assuming that I was speaking officially for the University of Wisconsin or for the Social Security Administration, um, but I assure you that I'm not. Um, we are appreciative of the, of the funding, but any opinions are my own. Um, so then we can go to slide three, um, and, that, and that's just to give you a roadmap um, and, and an overview uh, of what I'll cover in this first um, session. So the introduction, this is the last slide of. Um, I'm, I'm going to provide just a bit of background on the Savers Credit itself. Um, for those who aren't familiar with the credit, its structure, or the incentives that it creates. Um, and then we'll talk about the findings, so the outcome study and the process study findings. Uh, I, I put the outcome study findings first today. So those are collecting information through focus groups um, and an online survey with clients at 17 sites across both cities, so not just at the intervention site. So producing information um, that should be reflective of the VITA client population in those two areas. Um, and then the process study findings, which are um, learning about the operation of the intervention itself um, and, and what a larger scale outreach um, campaign might look like. And then I'll close with, with conclusions and, and a little bit of policy discussion. Okay, so slide four then shows the, the structure of the Savers Credit itself. So the Savers Credit um, provides a non-refundable tax credit of 10, 20, or 50 percent of contributions up to $1,000. Um, you can see on the slide how that um, how those match percentages break down. So there's a higher match percentage at lower incomes, um, a a as well the filing status of the client um, matters for what size of match the person would receive. Slide five then shows the other eligibility requirements. So in order to claim the savers credit, um, the tax filer can't be claimed as a, as a dependent on another return, um, can't be a full-time student. Um, those first two are, are, are the formal eligibility requirements. The third, that they have to have a positive tax liability, comes from the fact that the Savers Credit is non-refundable. Um, if it were a refundable tax credit, they, um, clients with no positive tax liability would be able to claim it, similar to what um, credits like the Earned Income Tax Credit um, do. Because there isn't 
Um, because it's non-refundable, it means that it can only reduce a tax liability for any client. Um, as we were looking at Vita site clients, that became a fairly large constraint. So keep in mind, you know, I'll give you the specific numbers um, in a minute, but keep in mind that that is a, a major consideration. Um, and then the last piece here is defining a qualified retirement savings account. So in order to claim the credit, the contribution has to be made to a 401k, IRA, or similar retirement savings accounts. Slide six then, and this is just a preview um, a bit of the Savers Credit history. So the, the, the first year um, of the Savers Credit uh, was tax year 2002. Um, in that year, 5.3 million, or there were 59 million eligible filers. So who met um, those initial eligibility requirements? Um, that reduces down to about 36 million right, if we limit to those who have a positive tax liability. So you can see that it's only about 65% of those who would otherwise be eligible. Um, would benefit from claiming the credit. Um, and, and utilization was 5.3 million. So that means it's around 9% of all eligible and around 14% of everyone with a positive tax liability. There is some improvement on that in the last 10 years. So the, the figures that I've seen for 2007, 2008 um, show an increase up to around 5.9 million, 6 million. Um, but th those numbers are still much lower than the take up rates that um, we see for retirement savings accounts among higher income households. So the question then um, that, that's being asked around the savers credit is, how, how do we explain the low levels of utilization? Uh, and there's hypotheses that there's low awareness. Um, there is some survey evidence that suggests that, uh, I think yeah. um, that it was the Transamerica Retirement Survey put it at 17% of eligible filers um, were aware that the savers credit existed. Um, as well, limited access to employer-based accounts. So for lower income households, particularly those that don't have a full-time job or have multiple jobs, they may not have access to um, a retirement plan through their employer. And then the final one is low interest in, in retirement products and, and savings. Um, and what I'm, I'll, I'll discuss that a little bit more with the outcome study findings. It, it relates, it, it relates to um, several of the questions that we asked there. Um, but what we're really trying to get at in that last bullet is prioritization of savings um, goals. So shorter term versus longer term savings goals. Okay, so slide seven is just the last bit of policy context. Um, there are a couple of different discussions happening around the savers credit right now. The first is about um, direct modification to the structure of the credit itself. So the, the president's um, initial budget proposal to Congress in the last two years has suggested or has proposed expanding to a 50% match for all out for all households below um, $65,000 in, in annual income. So expanding access to the um, to the credit as well as the size of the incentive, um, making the credit refundable again, expanding access, um, and then also depositing the credit into into a qualified account, so allowing a direct deposit of the credit rather than refunding the amount back to the taxpayer. Um, directly putting it in the retirement account itself. Um, this second set of proposals are really more fundamental changes to um, the mechanism through which to encourage retirement savings. So where the savers credit creates a financial incentive for any deposits, um, the auto IRAs would create an automatic mechanism for making those deposits into uh, um, a retirement account. The savers bonus um, uses a similar structure to the savers credit, um, but would allow a credit to be claimed for a much broader set of retirement accounts. So things like a certificate of deposit might be an eligible account, uh, allowing for a credit to be claimed towards shorter term savings goals. Um, and, and I'll return back to that policy context um, at the end of this, this talk. So slide seven shows the research questions. Um, are Vita sites effective outreach points for encouraging <laughs> There are a couple of reasons why um, that, that's likely the case. Um, so it is, it, it's a centralized point at which to reach a large number um, of eligible households as well to receiving a large lump sum amount. That might be an ideal point to encourage retirement contributions. Um, this second, so how, lar how should a larger outreach campaign be designed? What do we learn from the intervention um, about taking something like this to scale? Um, the third, what's the potential for a large scale outreach campaign to increase utilization? And then the fourth is what factors are most important to Vita clients' decisions. The, the first three there are really process study findings about what an intervention program would look like. 
Um, the fourth is really about the outcome study, and, and can we document client preferences for different savings products and accounts, and how clients make decisions about where to deposit um, long-term savings. So slide nine then, given those research questions, we created an intervention that has three main prongs. Um, developing a financial product. So on both sites, we were offering a, a simple IRA account um, with two or three investment options in that account, coupled with site-based outreach and marketing. So providing educational materials on site and directly introducing the saver's credit um, to clients attending either site. Um, we, we initially designed that, that outreach to be at the tax preparer stage, but quickly learned that having it through a centralized um, point of contact, so if there's a benefit screener or, or if there's um, a financial services specialist, um, that, that those um, individuals often have the, the expertise necessary um, to most effectively provide outreach. Um, and then the third was employer-based outreach and marketing. Um, that third component was time intensive for both sites. Um, of the nine employers that we eventually recruited, we were only were able to um, ha have one join um, and, and implement um, outreach activities to its employers. So for the most part, I'm going to focus on the first two um, today. The evaluation, as I mentioned before, includes both the process study and the outcome study. Um, slide 10 um, shows you the participating programs, um, as well the the basic structure for um, how clients are rooted through those sites. I'm looking at the time right now, so I think I want to skip ahead to, um, to slide 11 right away to talk about the outreach study, or the outcome study. So, so the goal of the outcome study was for us to collect information directly from clients um, about their current use of retirement savings accounts, um, their awareness of the saver's credit, and the decision factors that were the most important to them in making decisions about various savings products. Um, so, so we did that for a, a range of sites across both areas. So these responses are from VITA clients who may not have been exposed to the intervention, and in most cases, likely were not. Um, slide 12 shows the experience with retirement accounts. Um, you can see that 52% um, had access to a retirement plan through their employer. That means that for about half of clients, um, they don't necessarily have access to an employer, and therefore, um, it, it reinforces that VITA sites may be a promising point of outreach, that, that for around half of VITA clients, um, VITA sites might be a reliable um, resource for making deposits to retirement accounts. Um, the second piece of that shows previous experience. One of the surprises um, that, that comes out of the, the focus groups and online survey is the number of clients that had previous experience with a retirement account, but for whatever reason needed to make withdrawals um, early or close the account eventually. So you can see that um, around 45% um, had a retirement account at the time that we talked to them. Another 17% had had a, an account before, um, but didn't at the time of the survey. That's going to be a lower bound of the number who have made emergency withdrawals. Slide 13, then, um, shows contributions during the previous year to retirement accounts um, and, and also to non-retirement savings. Um, and you can see that contributions during 2010 um, were, were relatively modest. So um, just over 15% made a contribution to a retirement account. Um, and it's around, I, I believe it's um, around 85% um, have less than $1,000 to $2,000 um, in, in emergency savings available to them. Slide 14 then moves on to awareness of the saver's credit. Um, and this speaks directly to concerns um, that low awareness of the credit may contribute to low utilization um, of the saver's credit by eligible filers. Um, so of those that we talked to, 30% had ever heard of the saver's credit before. That, that largely reinforces concerns about awareness. Um, the next four items there are or aspects of the saver's credit itself. And what we're trying to get at is, is how a way of those who have heard of the saver's credit, how much knowledge do they have of this structure in order to understand what the incentive is that it creates. You can see that for the most part, if you've heard of the saver's credit, um, you also are aware of the basic aspects of retirement accounts. So you have to contribute to a qualified retirement account. Um, and there may be penalties for early withdrawals. Awareness of the incentive structure itself it is a little bit lower. So it's only around half of those who are, had heard of the saver's credit. Um, we're also aware that the match rate varies by income, um, and the maximum contribution is $1,000 per individual. 
Slide 15, then. Um, a- after, after documenting awareness, we ask clients a battery um, of different factors that might weigh into their um, evaluation of different savings products. Um, after we'd asked um, a range of different factors, we asked clients to indicate the one that was the most important to them. And, and that's what's being shown on, on this slide. You can see that the incentive, so the presence of a large financial incentive to make a contribution, is powerful. So for 36% of clients, it's the most important factor. Um, The other finding that comes out of this slide is that other aspects of um, the retirement savings product um, or the investment options also play into the the decision and, and often are the most important factor for clients when they're considering making contributions. So the ability to withdraw funds in an emergency, investment options, ease of setup and maintenance. Slide 16 then shows the focus group findings. Um, So I've been showing you the quotations on the previous slides are coming directly out of the focus groups. Um, For the most part, the focus groups reinforce the findings of the outcome study. Um, The first two items here show you um, that the basic findings were validated across both um, the online survey and focus groups. Um, The final two are new findings that come out of the focus groups. So um, the clients are interested in retirement savings and the saver's credit, um, but that short-term goals were were often a higher priority. So saving for their child's education, towards a home purchase, building an emergency cushion were the savings goals that came out um, among a large number of clients. Um, The last one is that clients have positive views of VITA programs and trust them for advice. Um, That's really a positive finding. Um, from our perspective, and, and I think it suggests a lot about how clients view VITA programs, that increasingly um, they're not just providing tax preparation services, but also are a resource for uh, financial services, um, potentially access to a financial advisor, um, or some of the savings accounts um, and other savings products that are offered on site. So with that, I'm, I'm going to move to the, to the process study, and I know that I'm moving a little bit quickly, but I want to make sure that we're saving um, plenty of time for questions and discussion. Um, as well. So given those findings of the outcome study, the questions from the process study are really, does the design of our pilot demonstration um, effectively create awareness? And is it designed to efficiently integrate itself um, into VITA sites? Um, And so, and with the end goal of thinking about what a larger scale outreach campaign um, might look like and whether or not it has the potential to um, create a a substantial impact on those overall utilization rates. Um, So those are sort of the questions to keep in the back of your mind as I'm I'm walking through the process um, study findings. So slide 18 um, addresses the question of whether or not VITA programs are an effective point of outreach. Um, you can see the focus group comment at the top um, largely reinforces um, the, the, pro- the reasons that we viewed VITA sites as a promising point of outreach in the first place. Um, but we also came across obstacles. So first off, a number of VITA clients don't have a positive tax liability. So um, you can see that it, it's around 90% of VITA clients were eligible to claim the savers credit, um, but that only around 30 to 45% um, had a positive tax liability. Those numbers are lower than the 65% um, with a positive tax liability among the, um, all filers across the country as a whole. As well, too many options may overwhelm clients. So at, at a number of VITA sites, um, there are offers of a savings account, um, other financial services, access to a financial advisor. Um, we heard from a number of site staff that they were worried about that there may be a threshold at which offering too much um, just overwhelms clients, um, and that in some cases less is more. The third is that the savers credit structure and eligibility rules are complex. Um, and, and this has a couple of implications. Um, this is one that really came out a, a, as a s- consistent finding across various aspects of the, the process study. Um, The first is is the structure of the eligibility rules. Um, Given the timeline of how sites um, would screen for eligibility, eligibility and a positive tax liability won't be known until the last step in the VITA tax preparation process, so at which taxes are actually prepared and the adjusted gross income and the tax liability are actually known. That means that if you want to target educational and outreach materials, it's very difficult to do that at early stages, particularly while clients are waiting in the waiting room. So that 
um, added complexity to our efforts to target um, outreach to clients who had, had the greatest potential to benefit from the Savers Credit itself. The second comment about complexity here it is about directly depositing um, from a tax refund into a qualified retirement account. So IRS rules um, currently would allow you to make a contribution to a, a qualified retirement account at any time during 2010 or up to the point of tax preparation um, and, and claim the savers credit for that contribution. If you wanted to make a contribution directly from your tax refund, that wouldn't be able to be claimed. You wouldn't be able to claim the savers credit until the following year. Making that distinction was difficult to do, and it often um, created confusion among both clients and tax preparers. Um, and so it added complexity to our ability to quickly um, explain in a clear way um, both the financial product and the incentive created by the savers credit itself and the options for clients. And, and sort of making sure that that presentation is clear and simple um, was really important to making sure that it was done consistently um, by site staff. The fourth is that the timeline for behavioral change is longer than one visit. In a lot of cases, you can expect that clients will walk into the site with expectations for um, ways that they'll, set, that they'll spend their tax refund. Um, so they may have already planned that they'll use it to pay down credit card debt or to make a large purchase. Given that, encouraging a retirement contribution on site likely requires active outreach before the client actually arrives at the site or using the pilot year to introduce the incentive in order to encourage contributions to retirement accounts in a future year. Um, and, and the final comment here, or, or the final obstacle, is that a large number of VITA clients have few non-retirement assets. Um, so building an emergency cushion for a number of clients may be um, a, primary, um, a primary goal. So slide 19 then. Um, walks through the, the structure of the, the intervention uh, and lessons for um, future interventions. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but I'll, I'll give you the highlights. Uh, for the financial product, establishing a simple product um, and making it available on site um, were important at both FIDA programs. Um, additionally, both FIDA programs, as they were looking to set up a, a retirement product um, for their individual site, had better luck with local providers. Um, you know, ideally, there might be one national provider that would be available to a large number of VITA programs. Um, pending that, we did have better luck with, with local banks. Um, marketing materials, I, I think that I've addressed this already, that it, it's efficiency of distributing the materials and providing centralized outreach um, were the core aspects of the design of our marketing materials. And then the employer partner piece. Um, I do think that outreach at... Um, employers does have strong potential to increase utilization of the savers credit. Um, for a VITAS program, though, it was very time and staff intensive um, with not a, a strong response from the employers, and, and so the recommendation would be to focus on the first two pieces um, before moving on to establishing employee partnerships. Um, so, so slide 20 then provides um, options for a large-scale outreach campaign. Um, the first would be to integrate the screening and outreach procedures directly into the tax preparation software um, and, and the tax preparation manual. Um, the goal there really is to simplify the screening process so that you can more efficiently distribute and, and target outreach materials and, and discussions so that not only are you lessening the time burden on site staff, um, but you're also um, but you're also allowing um, clients who aren't eligible for the savers credit to be targeted with other interventions or other products. Um, the second would be for individual VITA sites um, to voluntary impl voluntarily implement a streamlined version of the pilot um, demonstration. And you know we have the materials that we created for this um, for this pilot. Um, and, and absolutely, um, you know, for individual VITA programs that are interested in offering a, a, um, a retirement product on site, that opportunity should be there. Um, the final is what's the potential for an outreach campaign to increase utilization of the savers credit. Um, given the experience of our pilot demonstration, we're not comfortable extrapolating. This was a pilot demonstration in two specific cities. Um, and so in order to, to think about the overall impact on, on utilization of the savers credit as a whole, um, that's something that really would require a large scale outreach campaign, making a few adjustments um, to the pilot demonstration itself. Okay, so, so slide 21 introduces the policy discussion. And on slide 22, 
um, highlights the, um, the conclusions. So the options for a large-scale outreach campaign exist, the, those two recommendations that I, I just touched on, um, but may have limited impact on utilization of the saver's credit. Um, if we're thinking about the overall utilization rate, um, the ability of the saver's credit to increase contributions to retirement accounts um, or for an outreach campaign to increase the utilization rate itself um, requires a large impact given how few individuals and clients are eligible for the saver's credit and have a positive tax liability. Um, the second is that encouraging utilization of the saver's credit is dependent on the attractiveness of eligible accounts and products. This comes out of the outcome study findings. So for those clients where the, ins the size of the credit or the financial incentive is the most is, or is not the most important factor, other aspects of the credit itself or the products available come into play. Um, and so um, future efforts to um, or, or discussions around the, the saver's credit need to consider not only the size of that financial incentive, but the full package. So is the saver's credit interacting with the eligible accounts or other um, rules that are required or that come into play when we're thinking about clients claiming the um, claiming the credit or making an eligible contribution. So the conclusions here um, are, are all things that I've touched on. Um, the non-refundability of the saver's credit means that the saver's credit has no value for the majority of, of clients. Um, awareness of the saver's credit remains to be a concern. Um, the saver's credit is less valuable to households with few existing assets. So because there are penalties for emergency withdrawals, the expected value of that contribution and of claiming the saver's credit um, it is lower for households that don't already have an emergency cushion. Um, and then the final is that clients are interested in retirement savings and matching incentives, but short-term savings goals are often a higher priority. So targeting outreach, again, um, it is central to an effective intervention. So slide 23, then, um, shows returns to the, the policy context, so the various conversations that are happening around the saver's credit. Um, the first relates to modifications to the saver's credit itself, um, the second are the, the more fundamental changes to retirement savings accounts. Um, and there's two comments I want to make here. Um, the first is that outreach through VitaSites might be a good opportunity if there are policy changes to either the saver's credit or eligible accounts, that raising awareness of what those changes are um, would be important to the success of any policy revisions. Um, our results reinforce concerns about awareness of the saver's credit and the ability of VitaSites to reach a large number of clients. Um, the second is that the outcome study in informs um, informs the relevant factors when, when we're thinking about potential revisions to the saver's credit. That the financial incentive is one aspect of that, um, but the the attributes of the retire available retirement savings products are also um, central to the decisions of a number of clients. Um, so slide 24 are the remaining research questions. Um, the, the first is, is what. Um, the potential for an outreach campaign would be to increase overall utilization. Um, the second is, is whether or not clients are aware of the exceptions to withdrawal penalties and, and the extent to which they're used. I haven't been able to find clear, concrete um, figures on the, on the number of clients currently making contributions to retirement accounts and then eventually using um, hardship withdrawal exceptions or, or other exceptions um, in order to allow them to simultaneously save towards retirement while also using that um, account to build an emergency cushion. Um, and then the final is what the, what the trade-off is between a financial incentive and, and withdrawal restriction. So I, I want to stop there because I know that um, I'm running a little bit long. So I will hand it over to Jackie Lynn Coleman at the National Community Tax Coalition from here. Jackie Lynn? I'm sorry. <laughs> So um, this is Jackie Lynn Coleman, and so before before I move into the actual presentation, I did want to um, first thank John Spader and the rest of the team over at Apt Associates, and of course uh, the family over at University of Wisconsin um, Madison as well. In addition to that, I want to give out a special thanks to our two pilot partners, Accountability Minnesota and Campaign for Working Families. Um, that organization is actually based in Philadelphia. Additionally, I wanted to take the time to thank um, NCTC's policy analyst, Holden Weissman, for being the analyst and the coordinator of this um, initiative. We can go to the next slide. 
There are, you know, um, John laid out a number of um, elements, but one of the um, components that I really wanted to focus on was around these implications for the overall VITA field. So when thinking about rolling out a retirement initiative that connects back to the savers credit, um, there are three particular areas that we wanted to focus on. First is uh, the field issues. Secondly, program-specific issues. And third, client-related issues. And so I will go into further detail um, as we go through um, the presentation. So next slide. So you can see and can probably imagine there are a number of unique issues to the VITA field um, in terms of uh, focusing on low to moderate income populations that serve by um, this is actually appropriate for this particular target market um, to reach the savers credit. However, there are some aspects to consider that may impact the uptake of the actual credit um, itself. So a couple of things. First, in terms of marketing, we have found that um, marketing um, at the VITA site a lot of times is very, very uh, broad. Um, so it's really difficult and can provide a number of concerns when trying to also market um, for access to the, the savers credit um, when it connects back to um, retirement um, opportunities. So we're trying to figure out how we can streamline this particular process and decrease the level of frustration not only to the program staff and their volunteers, but also to um, clients that really want to save um, for retirement, but when they find out that they don't fit certain income guidelines or they have already drawn down or covered all of their tax liability, those, those clients that are actually interested in retirement savings then become a little bit um, frustrated because then they become ineligible for the savers credit. So marketing can be a little tricky. The other component um, under this bucket um, that is also a bit of a challenge and it's important for the VITA programs to really focus on, is around client um, reach. So the major difficulty, there's major difficulty in reaching these clients prior to the tax season, which complicates efforts to encourage pre-filing contributions. And so, you know, why would this be a challenge? Well, in order for programs to conduct this sort of outreach program, programs really must abide by the IRS regulation 7216, which emphasizing um, securing permission for the use and disclosure of clients' information. So client outreach can also be challenging because there seems to be a high percentage of address and email changes throughout the year, and many of our VITA programs only come into contact with their clients once a year, which, of course, is usually at tax time. So in, to encourage the ongoing savings, we need, we need multiple touch point opportunities with the taxpayers and to be able to have the organizations kind of in, incorporate these type of um, touch point opportunities is going to be essential to make sure that clients do find out about this particular opportunity and then they actually take advantage of the opportunity throughout the year. So going to the next slide, I um, wanted to begin to continue to lay out some, some program-specific um, issues um, that have to do with um, whether or not this should be emphasized, when, what should be emphasized when considering the effects of this particular project. So there's a few components here as well. One is around logistical and budgetary constraints that weigh heavily on, on programs. As many of you guys know, as nonprofits, you know, we're always seeking um, funding support in order to support our particular initiatives. Well, around tax time or tax season, funding a lot of times and resources that are being available are really uncertain. And so it's really important um, for programs to do a lot of advance planning. So if programs are really interested in focusing on a project like this, it is critical that programs start fundraising during the early part of the calendar year to improve their chances to have adequate funding and staff in place. Because as you guys know, it's a, it becomes a rippling effect if that piece is not in place and then now you're approaching your actual volunteer recruitment time, which begins somewhere around October and runs throughout the end of the year, 
if that funding is not in place, then it's hard to kind of like recruit for your special kind of like subject matter experts that can be your champions at your tax sites to um, continue to encourage retirement savings. The other ripple effect, of course, is also making certain that um, you have all of the information that you need in place in order to conduct the necessary volunteer training that also runs from, like, November through uh, mid to end January. So all of those components kind of feed off of one another, um, and which is why we are really encouraging programs that this is something of interest that um, programs really began to take a almost a full year to really plan to incorporate something like this in your service delivery offerings. Additionally, um, to something else to consider is that not all of the uh, VITA programs, you know, operate in the same way. So operations do, do vary in ter- when you're actually on the ground. So that process flow for asset building service delivery is also very critical and making sure, again, that there's multiple touch points when um, folks are begin to talk about savings opportunities and not just, you know, retirement savings, but any asset building delivery savings opportunities is uh, critical. And so that process flow is really important. And so moving over to the, to the next slide to continue with the program-specific issues, um, we also recognize that, you know, training training development is also um, limited in its reach. It may not be able to encourage volunteers to promote savings or the savers credit specifically. And, you know, um, this, again, can be both on a, a local issue, but in some cases nationally. And we'll get to an a area of the presentation where we talk about some of the solutions that um, the National Community Tax Coalition has developed as part of this project to make this uh, easier lift for programs as they're thinking about incorporating this particular offering. So with the training um, development, the component that is really, um, really uh, fascinating is the complexity of the savers credit overall. Um, and so because of the complexity, there may be a limit, um, limited amount of comfort um, of the volunteers to prepare and to promote um, the savers credit itself, which John has, you know, pointed out all the different variabilities in, in regards to that. Additionally, volunteers may not be comfortable promoting retirement savings to clients that have limited resources. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that um, the clients are not interested. They may very well be interested um, in actually saving for the future and in particular for um, purposes of retirement. So it doesn't matter really if the person, the taxpayer, has a uh, large anticipated refund or not. Still, volunteers, you know, because they know they're serving low to moderate income workers, they still may feel a little uncomfortable in doing so. Um, so this is it's going to be really important to have a common message uh, from the program um, and training level so that volunteers understand the importance um, to that particular organization. The other piece is around the re- resource constraints limit, limit um, the ability for programs to engage their partners that are not already offering services through their actual sites. So as you guys may know, um, VITA campaigns are extremely collaborative, and as a result of that, they leverage multiple public and private partnerships. And so a number of um, financial institutions, whether they are, you know, uh, banks or credit unions or um, financial services vendors that offer, like, prepaid debit cards. There's a lot of energy and collaboration between the VITA campaigns to identify feasible and effective products for the uh, folks that they serve. So you can go to the, to the next slide. However, you know, through that, though, the resource constraints and training capacity is, can, can be limited in order to actually um, engage new partners, uh, especially around a very new product and being delivered in a way that most programs, or I should say most financial partners, are not accustomed to. So trying to get them to kind of move outside of their comfort zone um, is also um, a heavy lift for many of the, many of the uh, programs or can be. So um, 
as John pointed out, there was kind of like two prongs uh, in which, or two strategies we, we were using in order to increase uh, retirement savings during tax time. One was, of course, through the VITA programs, and so those, you know, tax clients is coming in the doors. And the other way was actually through employers. So employers that uh, typically have um, a large sum of low income to moderate income folks or those that actually fit the income guidelines of um, and could actually benefit from the savers credit, but also had a employer-sponsored um, uh, retirement um, plan available through their through the employer was another strategy. But we found that um, that was a difficult or challenging lift. And again, many of our partners um, actually do work very closely with employers, but it's really important to be able to get inside of the door and get in the hands of the right people to make that um, actual connection. So um, the other piece of this, though, is also that new partners, and in particular financial service partners, may also create unwanted competition with existing products and, and or services. Um, and then finally, um, training of recruited partners should be better streamlined with program and volunteer training to avoid any type of duplication. Moving to the next slide, I wanted to um, also focus on this uh, kind of like third prong, which is some of the client-oriented issues. So there are some unique challenges that arise specifically to the population of VITA clients when connecting to retirement um, savings access and desirability. So a few of those, of course, include clients may not be receptive to the products currently available or may lack access to the, the products. We know that in some instances, check systems remains a significant access issue, and also there's this um, mistrust of financial products um, as well. And so we know there's some variability um, when it comes to the level of mistrust, uh, as well as for those that have or have not been um, negatively reported to check systems, but it's something to, to watch out for. Additionally, the number of clients with long-term savings plans or the ability to save long-term is limited. For for all of our groups, I think it's, you know, one of the things that has elevated on a national level is that precautionary savings has really taken precedent. And so clients um, um, in many cases have perceived um, plans for windfall funds. So their lump sum tax refund, they're already, they've already started planning for that this fall and have a, a pretty clear idea of, like, how they're going to actually utilize that tax refund um, come come um, the tax the actual tax season, so this is another kind of like heavy lift for programs as they're um, having conversations with their clients during um, the tax season, and there's there's you know some shifting going on in terms of which direction a client may or may not choose to to go into. And then um, the other component is around the credit complexity um, also inhibits clients from being able to predict whether they, they will actually benefit from um, actually contributing to a retirement um, product at tax time. So, again, this education and training piece is, can get really, really difficult unless we can begin to really simplify and potentially expand um, the savers credit. So some, moving to the next slide to policy implications, um, these are some of the issues facing VITA programs to encourage retirement savings are as follows. So one, um, which was also, many of these were also mentioned earlier through John's presentation, is the component of the fact that it's not, it's currently non-refundable. So many of our clients that we see, they have already, um, been able to reduce or remove their tax liability through the other refundable credits. So that's one policy implication that we need to deal with on a national scale. The other piece is around withdrawal penalties and short-term savings needs. So, um, so that piece is important. And then co constraints from eligibility determinations and then finally program diversity. So moving towards the, the next slide, um, we'll talk about how NCTC is planning to address some of these implications. 
So one is around really supporting legislative reforms currently proposed by a few of our national partners. One is around the service credit reform, um, which is being championed by um, CFED. So, again, making the savers credit um, uh, have a refundable portion and then uh, some type of match incentive. The second um, um, policy uh, that is being championed by New America Foundation is the savers bonus. And this one actually begins to expand that, uh, the traditional savers credit to be a little bit more inclusive um, of other types of savings opportunities, such as the short-term precautionary savings in college. And it, these two will also have a match incentive component attached to it. And then from NCTC's perspective, the other components, in order to really begin to help shape and prepare a lot of our um, programs, is to uh, develop standardized training and marketing materials um, and a VITA tailored retirement product. Um, and so a lot of that heavy lifting has been done um, by Holden Weissman and in partnership with um, our pilot programs as well is to actually create um, and we'll be actually rolling out a retirement savings and savers credit training later on this month through our NCTC online university. And finally, we have brokered a relationship with E-Trade. One of the uh, one of the challenges that we faced this this past tax season was being able to find a national product, a retirement product that we can actually connect all the programs to. And we're hoping that we had that in place earlier um, for the uh, this past tax season, but instead we actually went to some local financial institutions, and so there was you know two different products being offered. Um, through the two different organizations. So we're hoping through this particular initiative with um, E-Trade that we'll be able to have a stronger um, retirement product that we'll be able to connect um, multiple organizations to ac across the country. And then um, finally, I just wanted to share, um, I'm not going to go through this, but um, on the, last, the next slide is just the two legislative proposals that I mentioned earlier um, the reform of the Sabres credit, which is the option one championed by CFED, and then on the, um, the next column is the second option, which is around the Sabres bonus, which in that particular proposal is being championed by the New America Foundation. So um, thank you all for, for having me to participate and um, present to you guys today, and I will pass the torch over to Richard. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Um, I hope everyone can hear me okay. Well, all right, let me try this better. Can everyone hear me okay? Does it sound better? Yes. Thanks, everyone. Uh, if we can just go to slide 41. I know we don't have much time, so I'll get through this very quickly. But uh, we're with the Stakeholder Partnership Education and Communication Department, or SPEC unit, and we're the Outreach and Education Department of the IRS. And You've heard a lot about VITA programs today, and we are the organization that manages the Voluntary Income Tax Assistance Program and also the Tax Counseling for the Elderly Program. We can go on to slide 42. Just to, real quickly, some results for this past filing season. Our partners uh, prepared over 3.1 million tax returns this year, and there was about 12, 000, over 12,000 VITA sites. 88,000 volunteers, returning over $3.7 billion in tax refunds at the federal level. What's not on your slide 42 is there, I just received it a little while ago, but for the tax year 2009, which is the last data we have on, there was 6,737,000 approximately returns that did claim the saver's credit. And I am awaiting to get the dollar amount, and we'll share that with Nicole for that. I don't have a breakdown of the VITA for that yet either. Uh, if we go to slide 43, I, I think we've already touched upon this with the savers credit eligibility, but uh, it is for low to moderate income workers, and the credit can be worth up to $1,000 or $2,000 if you file joint. On slide 44, 
uh, some new, I shouldn't say new legislation, but some uh, cost of living adjustments came out uh, a couple weeks ago. And if you your income is increased, I'm sorry, if the, your adjusted gross income, it's now upped it to $1,000 if you're married, $750 if you had a household, $500 for single. So that's uh, a positive thing. And if we go to slide 45 for people that like more visual, this is just a, a recap of what I just said with the with the Savers Credit new limitations. And slide 46, um, what, is, what are we doing? What is the IRS and SPEC doing about with VITA to promote the Savers Credit? And we're very aware of the underutilization of the credit. So in the past few years, we've done quite a few things. We've increased outreach. Um, we created a publication, 4703, that was available last filing season, a retirement savings contribution credit. And we've issued uh, various alerts to our volunteers and emphasized them to look at the Box 12 on W-2 to make sure they're claiming it. Our quality people have, have found out by going through and looking at returns that were filed that uh, many people are just missing some information. They weren't, the volunteers were not checking the information on the box. Um, also, we want to make sure people utilize the publication 590 on IRAs and review the form 8880. And we can go on to slide 47. This is just a, a, a picture of the, the front of the Retirement Savings Credit Contributions Credit publication. If you don't have this publication, if you're not aware of it and you want to get it, you can get it through your local spec office or if you're working with a tax consultant, you can get it through um, any of those, or you can actually call up and just order the form yourself. And then I want to switch gears a little bit on slide 48 and just talk about the, the market for free tax services and, and how large it is out there. We know that there's over 19 million people making less than $36,000 a year, and we, only about 3 million are being touched annually since 2007, so that leaves a, a, a large amount of people. So we've come up with, uh, I shouldn't say come up with, we, we have uh, gone with a couple different ways that we can reach this other population, what we call um, alternative VITA. And on slide 49, the free assisted self-service tax preparation is just a way where someone can like you see now in grocery stores and gas stations, basically prepare your own return by having a volunteer at the at the site. And this year there will be a up to five different online software providers. I've listed four of them here. There is one additional one that uh, I don't didn't have the name for, but uh, when I get that, I can send that out to Nicole as well. And if we go to slide 50, the virtual Vita is the second model. And uh, basically, it's very similar to the, the previous model, except uh, this will be using TaxWise software, which is the current software that we provide at the IRS. And it's very similar, um, like I said, to the FAST program, except with this program, the volunteers can use uh, some sort of video conferencing, like Skype, or and also use traditional technology by sending the information by, via fax or, or email. And a lot of these have encryption devices now, too, as well. Slide 51 are just a couple of current asset building strategies that we have at the IRS that we offer um, during tax time. And, of course, free tax filing, we know that saves 100 to $200, depending on the type of return. Direct deposit, um, you can now split your refunds in up to three separate financial institutions. We have savings bonds. You just need to check a box on, on the form on your 1040 to get savings bonds. We also offer prepaid cards and if you're using the TaxWise software. And that is it. I wanted to leave a little bit of time for you guys to have some Q&A. So thank you. Thanks, Richard. Um, we have had some questions come in. So we'll start with one here that probably um, – Richard and Jackie Lynn, this is best suited for either or both of you. 
Did the low utilization numbers and savers credit consider that IRS form 8880, the credit form, only plugs into forms 1040 or 1040A? Um, and so this person had said, I'm guessing most of the target population could do the 1040 easy and not see the retirement credit lines on other forms. So are sites using easy forms or do the online versions prompt the question when income appears to permit the credit? Um, I, I think I, I couldn't hear very well, but I think the question was uh, if, if our VITA sites are using the easy forms, other forms where you can't do the retirement credit. I, I know that in sites that I've worked in, I've always set my default to be a 1040 so that everything will be included in there. Great. Um, another question is, what is the rationale for denying eligibility to anyone who's been a full-time student at any time during the calendar year? Um, this individual made the point that many unemployed individuals are being encouraged to go back to school and yet are going to lose out on the savers credit. That's sure, I can take a stab at it. So I obviously don't speak for the IRS, so I can't say anything official. Um, my, my guess is that is that a, a large population that's getting screened out there are graduate students or other students who will have higher income trajectories over their life course, um, but who are temporarily lower income. Um, and, and so that's that's generally the rationale when that um, restriction is included. Um, but I can't speak specifically about the savers credit. Great. Well, uh, those are the questions that came in, and I just want to take a moment to ask John, Jackie, Lynn, or Richard if they have any closing comments they'd like to make regarding any points that maybe you didn't have time to bring up, but now we have a couple minutes. <laughs> so I, I have one um, comment that, that's come up, and that's one, one of the things that we really struggle with in, in how to interpret these findings is what's, what's the right you know, or is there a right prioritization of, of savings goals, and is there a way to simultaneously save towards multiple objectives at the same time? So, you know, given that saving is hard, um, and that a lot of people have multiple goals, so, you know, kids' education, creating an emergency cushion, um, retirement, and, and that retirement may be at any order in that hierarchy, is there a way to encourage long-term savings at the same time that you're allowing other help, or that you're allowing the household to save towards other things at the same time? Um, I don't have a great answer to that. Um, one of the comments that I will make, though, is if we're thinking about the savers credit structure, the 50% tax rate does create an opportunity um, to get to something closer to allowing households to save towards multiple um, different goals. That that 50% that credit, if you're in that group, that should outweigh any withdrawal penalty that you eventually face. As well, there are hardship exemptions, um, exemptions related to buying first-time home ownership, um, other things. So, you know, sort of viewing retirement savings accounts um, and the savers credit, obviously they're, they're very closely tied towards retirement savings, but they do allow just a little bit of flexibility um, for households that where building an emergency cushion and, and other goals are um, also priorities. And we've actually had one last question come in that I'm, I'm going to put out there. Um, what outreach or on-site on outreach strategy, strategies did the pilot site settle on as most successful? Can you touch on that, John or Jackie Lynn? Or are these, is this available online for people? So in, in terms of out, out, outreach strategies, I it, it's hard to say m most successful. The, the ones that... The, the outreach strategies that we eventually gravitated towards were those that were um, really efficient to distribute. So materials that um, clients could read in the waiting rooms, posters, um, were a great way to generate interest. Um, you know, if someone sees a poster, they'll then um, find someone at the site to ask questions to. Um, but it, 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 we started with an idea that it would um, really be based around a conversation and, and tailored to that individual at the tax preparation stage. Um, that's a point during the tax preparation process where time really is um, hard to come by. Um, and so we started moving towards um, materials that, that were easier to distribute and, um, and that would allow clients to um, consider the various incentives created by the savers credit and then ask questions um, about their individual situation afterwards. Um, the difficulty there obviously is targeting. 
And well, this is like Jackie Lynn. I will just add to that that um, as programs are thinking about um, pushing out um, marketing materials about the upcoming tax season, what we do hear a lot from our um, our campaigns from across the country is that when clients come onto site and they did not have any type of forewarning that certain financial services was going to be available, they are less likely to participate in that process because they have already kind of done their time accounting in terms of how much time they're going to dedicate at that particular site. Um, when they have the information up front through some kind of postcard uh, mailing or through social media that you're going to have a re, you know retirement products available and things like that prior to the tax season, then they start thinking about and planning their time differently when they're going in to get their tax return done. So I think some of that pre-season um, marketing is also important. Good. Well, I'd like to just thank our speakers and all of you participating out there um, on today's webinar. We really appreciate it. And the webinar will be archived at cfs.wisp.edu and posted within one week from today, and all of the slides will be available on the website as well. Our next webinar is on Tuesday, December 13th. Kristen Eschenfelder will present public libraries as financial literacy providers and you'll all be receiving a registration email uh, in the next couple of weeks. So thank you, and have a great day.